Well, good morning. <laughs> for the next couple weeks, and, and I stress for the next couple weeks because we're not going to rush what we're doing. Um, we're going to spend some time talking about how John Wesley uh, viewed salvation. And so we have, we have some steps to work through. Ideally, we'll get to all the ones I want to get to today, but we're not going to lose any sleep if we don't because we have next week to circle back around. I want to set it up a little bit um, first, but um, let's do something first. Where are all my Baptists at? Raise your hand if you were raised Baptist, not me. Just keep them up, keep them up, keep them up. Raise your right hand. I state your name, do solemnly swear that I will not use the word saved at any point today. Amen. That's a fun way to start, right? You know, like, wait a minute, because it, al- it always comes up. Because denominationally, we view salvation so differently across the whole spectrum. I grew up Lutheran, so that moment of justification, which is an important point in in Wesley's theology, that's sort of the end point for you as a Lutheran, right? Because Martin Luther believed humans were so rotten, there was nothing else they could do. They were too trapped in their own sin, but as long as they accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, then they were okay. And part of that is that's just as far as he got. Well, we talked last week about about Wesley, right? We did his history for those of you that were here and we talked a lot about how he really wrestled with his own salvation. If you remember, he's on that ship coming back from an absolutely failed ministry in North America and the ship encounters storms to a point where he, you know, everybody thinks they're going to die and, and he, is just, he is just scared to death of dying because he is so uncertain about what's next. Did I do enough? Did I do enough to please God that I'm going to get to go to heaven? And remember, those Moravians were on that ship, and they were just at peace. And so he really wrestled with with salvation. He really wrestled with how, how we come to know God's grace, and then how we come to accept it, and then the then what. And so that's a big thing in, in understanding how Wesley views salvation. There's two, there's two terms for our view of salvation. One is the order of salvation. The other is the way of salvation. And those are, have two very, very different meanings to it. Um, for me, I like to think of it sort of as, and, and I'm going to click on this, and, and then I'll go back to that other slide. This is kind of how I view salvation. And I've seen it put to me this way, and it really, really makes sense. I mean, th- this is a river, right? So we're going, there, there's a beginning and there's going to be an end. But you have all these points that you're traveling down where it's just not linear. It's just not straight, right? And so there can be times where you've traveled a long way, but you get back over here and you can see right there. And it doesn't look like you've come that far at all. So when we think of, of Wesley and we talk about the order of salvation, it's, it's not that neat. It's not that, it's not just boom, 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 salvation. I wish it did, but we're human and we're fighting a lot of, a lot of our own humanity here on earth and that makes it tough. So let's start with, with this part in the beginning and who, who has their Bible? The pastor did not bring his Bible. Thank you. Will you open, will you open to this passage. I'm going to have you read it in just a second. Oh, and then by the way, um, I see some new faces here this morning, by the way, we're here last week. Hi. How many of you read the sermon? I tried to. Yeah, I'm like you. I tried. tried There's so many words in there that... (laughs) (laughs) I gave up. John Wesley was awfully wordy. Um, Well, you know, and and it's, like I said, it's okay if you didn't. Um, For those of you that did, what is, what is if, if you had to sum it up in one sentence, um, and we'll go, we'll go college on this, okay? Um, and what I mean by going college is raise your hand and give me an opinion, and I'll give you partial credit. Isn't that how college works? Edgar Allan Poe was a drunk. Yes, partial credit. You know, and, and anyway, so anybody, throw that, throw at me 
what you think that, what, what you, in one sentence, what you thought that sermon was about. have to do the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Partial credit. Or you do everything, you do everything in your work, whatever your work is. Mm-hmm. 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 Dedication. Dedication, very good. I'll give you this one. And because and this one is really a, uh, th- this is sort of that tipping point sermon where he says no matter what, I try to do no matter what we try to do as men we cannot do this alone he tried so hard to work out his own salvation he tried to be such a good person he tried to be just very faithful and and righteous and all that he did but he knew apart from complete faith and acceptance in Jesus Christ that his salvation meant nothing because even all of his good works still caused him to have fear and so uh, that's that's the the point of that that sermon. And, and for those of you that liked it so much, I do have another one, by the way. Um, I don't know if it's more words. Well, it is because it's longer. But um, I hope you enjoy it. It's Salvation by Faith, and we'll do that on the way out. There are, there are, did you, do you have your scripture? Yes. Let's do it. Philippians 2, 12, 13. Mm-hmm. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. <coughs> For it is God who is, at, who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Yes, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because it is God that is at work in you. That was a key passage for Wesley in, in understanding his salvation. Uh, there's There's five steps in the order of salvation technically Um, we're going to try to get through the first three today though i doubt that's going to happen we'll definitely get through the first two and here's how i want you to think about salvation because this is the way wesley wanted you to think about salvation he wants you to think of it as a house okay and so as you move down through these steps, and we're going to go into each one in, in much deeper detail, but um, you start with provenient grace. And what I want you to think of that as is sort of the street view of the house. You're happening by this house, and um, there's a gate, and, and you want to enter the gate because you want to go to this home. You've seen it. It's beautiful. And that's, that's provenient grace. Convicting grace is like a porch. You're on the porch ready to go into the house. The justifying grace is the doorway, which justification as a doorway may seem odd, but we'll make sense of that. Sanctifying grace, which we'll definitely talk about next week, is living in the house. And we are, our goal is to live in God's house, to live fully in God's house. And so this is the process that, that John Wesley saw on the order of salvation. Any questions on that? Okay. I want to recap real quick just a few points from the sermon. Like I said, salvation was Wesley's major point of struggle. He said, let me look death in the face and I am troubled. If you remember in the very beginning, and this is something that is is worth mentioning, the very, very beginning of that sermon, um, he talks about um, some of the great truths, the difference between morals, between the moral idea of good and evil are known to the heathen world. So what, what do you think that means when he says that? Essentially that, that the world, even apart from an understanding of Christ, has an understanding of right and wrong. There is a, there is a moral code that is embedded in our world that we tend to live by. And so Christian or not, um, you can have this. You can have this understanding of right and wrong, but what he said was he said even the most improved and deeply thinking men remain totally ignorant. Because what he realizes is whether you have a good sense of right and wrong, if you don't have a good foundation, a relationship with God and faith in Christ, then your good works don't matter, right? And so, you know, you, you could live that upright, fully, fully, fully 
moral life, whatever you want to call it, and you can remain totally ignorant. You can remain totally in the dark. And then the last point was that they can only be brought into the light by the gospel and an understanding of their need for repentance. And so that will really touch on our first two points today. The first one is provenient grace. What is provenient grace, Methodists? I think it means that it was there for you before you even knew it existed. Yes, yes, that is that is correct. It is provenient grace, and, and the best way you could put this, and, and we'll use Titus 2.11 for this, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. There are, there are things that we are not capable of doing, that only God is capable of doing. And this is a very central point of, of a lot of denominations, this idea of provenient grace, of God coming before. God's grace is what makes your salvation possible, right? And we, kind of, we talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ, faith in Jesus Christ, and the repentance of sins, which we get to um, in, the, in the second part with the, with the, as we move on from provenient grace. But it's for the grace that God brings salvation that, that all men have appeared. And we said it goes before. It pre precedes human action, and it's available to all. It's sort of like a, uh, it's like a substance floating in the atmosphere, right? It is there and it is available for everyone. So when you think about that, that is the gate to move towards the house. You have to have provenient grace because without it, that gate is going to remain locked. You cannot get into it without what God has done before. Because one of, one of the most dangerous things that we can do is assume that we don't need God's grace to achieve salvation, right? that we can just do it on our own, and that's not the case. The second part about it is, is it should, the prevenient grace is meant to move you off your mark a little bit. You know, you think about, you think about walk down the busy street and somebody kind of bumps your shoulder and moves you off the mark a little bit, right? It's meant to do that. It is a start of a process. This awareness of prevenient grace, the availability of it, should begin the process of a change in us and that arrow of change should be pointing up okay as we become aware aware of God's grace and and what he has done for us and then the last part and this is a big part of Wesley's uh, theology is that what provenient grace does is it empowers our free will free will was a big factor for John Wesley he absolutely believed that God could offer you all the grace in the world. You had the free will to reject it if you didn't want it. Um, and so that is, that is where, that is, that is the tipping point um, between, and, and one of the things he was criticized for was up until that point, provenient grace, his theology of provenient grace was, was Calvinist. But then once he kicked in this idea of free will, that no, you can choose to not accept Christ. You can choose to not have a relationship. Important to understand. And he understood that from, from John's gospel. We love him because he first loved us. That we do have the power to, God gives us love and we can say, no thanks, I don't want it. How do you feel about that? Anybody disagree with John? It's okay. I won't, we won't tell him. Um, I mean, you know, cause, cause, honestly, it's, it's, it's a tough thing to, to grapple with because the question is, you know, what is free will, right? Can we really reject something from, from God? And part of that is it comes down to understanding God's desire. God's <laughs> desire to be in a relationship with us. That goes, yes, ma'am. We can reject it, but God does not reject us. God does not reject. No, as a matter of fact, it's God is constantly chasing, right? God is constantly after us. And, uh, and that goes all the way back to Genesis 3, right? That, that we have this notion in our minds, and, and one of the, one of the uh, and, and this will be more for convicting grace, but it will be a good transition into it 
is that part of our inability to accept grace is really just a lack of our own awareness. We really do. And, and you know, when we think about repentance, we think about the bad stuff, the big stuff, like the, you watch, like the watching the news stuff, right? Like, I can identify those sins, right? This, this murder and this, this assault and this theft and all that. That's, those are sins. I can see it. But sometimes we struggle with our own. And sometimes we struggle with seeing our own shortcomings. And, and so um, it is through that lens, it is through that humanity, that human nature, that we can't actually reject provenient grace. What, what questions do you have for me about this? Well, you guys are easy. That's easy. Okay. Okay. So we all accept God's grace, right? Okay. Well, let's talk about convicting grace, okay? Convicting grace is that bridge between understanding God's grace and accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's that bridge grace. That's why they call it the porch, because it is in this moment that we have to do some personal work, okay? What convicting grace is about more than anything is repentance, okay? It's, it's about understanding that we're sinful people, okay? That, that it's in our nature, in our hearts to be selfish, and have sort of a self-centered sense to, to what we're doing. And the nice thing about convicting grace is it helps us see who we really are, okay? And, and that's an important, important thing to, to understand. And it makes us want to change our nature of not only our relationship with God, but the nature of our relationship with each other. So many times we build relationships out of personal ambition. What can this relationship do for me? How can this relationship advance my career? How can this relationship, whatever it might be. Um, and, and convicting grace calls us to look at our relationships differently with each other and more importantly with God to say, you know, this is not about me. This is about my submitting, submitting my will to the care of others. And to be able to do that, you have to be able to look at what your shortcomings are. And, and the idea of that is it allows us to see just how deeply broken we are. And I think that that's an important thing for us to understand. It's not a fun thing to talk about, you know. Repentance doesn't sell seats. But it does, it, it is a constant reminder of why we need this relationship with Christ, why we need this relationship with the church and the community. Is because when you venture out on your own, um, it's a cold, brutal world, right? But the nice thing is, and, and, and Wesley says this, is that it's not meant to be discouraging. You're not meant to look at yourself and go, I can't believe how rotten I am, and just be down in the dumps. It doesn't work that way. You are technically supposed to be uplifted by it. This understanding of like, okay, yeah, I, I really do need God. I really need to follow Christ and understand the gospel. And so it is in that, that idea of those behaviors that, that, that we seek to change. Okay, we seek this, this desire to change. Any questions right now? So, and what it ultimately ends up doing, this convicting grace, is it leads us to the door of faith, which is acceptance of Christ as our Savior. And that brings us to our third point, since we have no questions. You guys are easy. We might get through the whole thing today. Is justifying grace. Justifying grace is, is simply put, it is the moment in your life when you fully accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you come to this awareness that you are justified only through faith and faith alone. Can you read again for me? Romans 5.1. While she's looking that up, I talked a little bit last week. Um, about John Wesley's Aldersgate experience, right? That he goes to this, um, that he goes to this Bible study in this home. And if you were in the 8:30 service, you heard that he does so begrudgingly. He has no desire to go to this Bible study, but he goes, 
And it is there and on Martin Luther's commentary on the Romans that he understands this idea of justified by faith and faith alone. Do you have it? Uh -huh. Go ahead. Uh, Romans 5.1. 5, 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. So having been justified by our faith. And so what this becomes is this becomes the choice of accepting God's free gift of grace. And it's not a predestined thing. Okay, this is a free will belief of John Wesley that you could you could understand provenient grace. You could realize that your sins aren't great. That doesn't mean you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You could go, well, I, I'm just rotten. It's just the way it is, you know, and just move on with your day. Um, and and the other part that that is important to remember, you know, we talked about um, think about that river. There are so many times in our life where it feels like we are bouncing between these, these levels of grace. That's why it's not, a, not an order. It feels like sometimes you can get to, you know, you're at, just, you're at justification. You accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and then you have this time where you just walk away, right? Where you walk away and say, you know what, I, I think that all of this is just a fraud, you know? And uh, there's people that do that, you know, unfortunately. And then pray, prayerfully they find their way back, right? And it's almost like you, you, you've started the process. And, and so you can bounce around in, in, these, in these different, and that's why, you know, we use the river as that example. Because it's not that clean. Because life and our humanity is not that clean. It's, it's messy. We're filled with a lot of fears and doubts and, and just trouble. We have awful things that happen, and it cuts right to our soul. And so that can be hard. Some are faithful and remain strong through even the hardest of things, but not everybody does. And it, it's sad and it's hard, but, but that's the truth of it. So um, a lot of people reach this moment of justification. And it's something that I've really thought a lot about because... Let me, let me do a question this way. Can you attend church your whole life and not achieve justification? Why? I always follow up with why, by the way. So if you answer, yeah. You have to accept it. Yeah, yeah. You can come and be part of a church community. You can come be part of the body and not, not accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, not follow His teachings, not, not believe it, you know? Um, if church is more as, as, a, as a duty. You know what I think about a lot? Huh? You're just believing in works. Yeah, you're just believing in works. And, and, you know, one of the things that I think we get guilty of sometimes in, in the church um, is, is with, our, with our children and with our youth. You know, I think sometimes we give them stuff to do, and then we lose them when they leave. And, and it's because we didn't always lead them to Christ. We gave them something to do one night a week, you know. Um, we, we've raised a, a, an army of great dodgeball players. Um, and I say that jokingly, and, and I'm not talking about Asbury specifically. But I think that we, you know, we have to, with great care, understand that... Um, we are, we, people are growing towards that moment of justification. They can spend their whole life in a church and never quite get there. So we have to be careful about what our community is really built on, what our, what our foundation is. I think that's, that's important. So Wesley described justifying grace as, as one of two great turning points in the life of a Christian. Um, the second one is, is sanctif sanctification or sanctifying grace, which we will get to, and we'll talk about a lot um, next week. <clears throat> but this is this realization, this dawning, the, this Aldersgate moment is really, if you go through the history of his life, is one of the def it's, it's the defining moment. The, the, the Moravians on the ship, that's, that is critical. Um, but all I did was just beat him up a little bit. It was this moment, this Aldersgate moment, that really made him understand that my faith in Jesus Christ is the most important thing. It is the most important thing. And what it does is it, it frees the believer from the power of sin. Plain and simple. Um, you know, we talked about that this morning. If you haven't been to service yet, one of the things we're doing today is we are reaffirming our baptismal 
covenant. When we step into our baptismal covenant, we are accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are being baptized under the Trinity, under the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it is through that faithfulness that the baptismal cleanse can occur. And so that's also one of the reasons, we'll get into this in week four, uh, one of the main reasons why we don't rebaptize. If you come from a denomination that, um, that accepts the Trinity, if you're baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we will not rebaptize you no matter what. And if we do, then we, we, we can kind of get canned, I guess is a good way to put it. Um, because we don't believe God got it wrong the first time. Now we'll reaffirm it. We'll do the liturgy like we do this morning and we do every year for Jesus' baptism, but we just simply don't, uh, don't rebaptize. Um, but you're freed, from, you're, you're freed from the power of sin. And with John 3.16, the important thing is that we understand the weight fully of what God did for us. That is a key moment of justification. It's not just to say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but to understand fully the weight of what God has done. For I so loved the world that I gave my only Son. And that is a powerful thing to think about. As parents, that is a powerful thing to think about. That God sacrificed His only Son for every single one of us. And so it's in that, in that justification that we can begin the process of starting to change. See, that's, that's the big kicker here as you walk through the doorway of justification. Okay? Have, have you achieved your, through faith in Jesus Christ, is that going to get you to eternal glory? Yes. But what John Wesley absolutely believed is that after you achieve justification, you should change. There should be changes in your life as, as you move to be a greater imitator of Christ. And so that's important. That's where the, this whole sanctification comes in that we're going to talk about a lot next week. And then the last part of justifying grace is it's more than forgiveness. It's being a new person. As, as, as I read, God wants you to have your cake and eat it too. And so to have your cake, you have to accept Jesus Christ. And to eat it too means that you move on towards salvation, which is going to be a, a change in your behavior, it's going to be a change in how you live, how you view God, and more, and how you view each other. What questions do you have? For, okay, I'm going to say that word. <laughs> Save. <laughs> Spell it. So, in Methodist faith, this step is what in the Baptist faith would be called being saved. Yes. Okay. Yes. But y'all have got another step you have to do. There was a, well, it's you say it's another step we have to do. What it is is it is a step that is going to happen okay. if you have fully given your life over to Christ. Yeah, and that's what that's what we'll talk about a lot next week with sanctification is as you give your life fully over to Christ, there should be changes in your behavior who you are, how you walk, how you talk, how you relate to people. Um, and it's, it's really cool. It's about living in, in the house and wanting to fully imitate Christ. But, but your term, you should be, doesn't mean that we're not going to, not, that should is not always in our lives. That is correct. That is correct, yeah. Yeah, that's one of the, the should is a, a very powerful word, word in the human language and in human behavior. I should do this, and, and that is where, and, and the other part of that, you know, that is, um, there, there's, when you talk about save, there's not a lot of room for free will in that theology. John Wesley was huge on theology. He thought you could reject um, any, any step in this process, but for provenient grace, because it's there. You can choose not to accept it, um, but it's always going to be there. No. What other questions? We actually, we actually made it. Um, well, in the secular world, that last statement up there, the last bullet, kind of taking it, they don't view the steps or the process of sanctification as what that word phrase means in the secular world. Mm -hmm. Because 
that sounds more like he dreamed to be married type. Mm -hmm. and of course, we know sanctification involves uh, putting God first, Christ first, and almost always that's going to involve some sacrifice on our part. Some it's because it's not we don't see it as a sacrifice because our mindset, our thought process has changed. But to the secular world, that creates all kinds of problems because it looks like you're not having your cake and eating it too. You're mm -hmm. going off down this other road and you don't look like you're the mm -hmm. That's a problem. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that, um, I, I think we're guilty of that in the church world as well um, sure. with what we make important in the life of the church. Um, do we keep the gospel at the center of, of all we do? And I don't mean we as an Asbury, but you know, we, we, can, we can do a have your cake and eat it too that um, attracts a lot of people but does it for the wrong reasons, right? Um, and so we have to really be careful. If you remember last week, I talked about um, the Wesleyan quadrilateral, right? For those of you who were here, I drew it on the board. Um, and it always talks about Scripture as foundation. So you have Scripture, and then you have experience and tradition. And, you know, and, and so that's, that's a critical understanding of how we, how we view um, this. Because Wesley took all of his understanding of salvation from Scripture. What else? Okay. Well, then that's it. We're done for today. Um, I've got, I'm going to put this here um, right next to the copies of this that didn't get taken, but that's all right. Um, next week, like I said, we're going to talk about uh, sanctifying grace. Uh, we can go on to glorifying grace, but what glorifying grace is, is, is that moment you transition into God's eternal house. So um, that's a, we're, we're not going to do much speculating because we know, we know only up to a certain point, right? Um, but we have faith that what it is is absolutely beautiful. So, any other questions for me? Is, is the thing from last week over there? Mm -hmm. Uh, the sermon? Yes, it is. Yeah, there's still, still a few copies of it right there. And then if you missed last week, um, Tom already has it up on YouTube. I guess Tom is making a whole, whole thing here, which is a, a blessing. Um, so... I don't, I don't like to look at myself on camera, so either. <laughs> anyway, let me close this with a quick word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are so thankful for this opportunity to be together. It is a blessing when we can come and, and talk about the glorious things that you continue to do and the, the ways you continue to heap blessings upon us. Uh, God, we ask that you keep us focused on, on your grace and, and understanding that, that it comes before and that without it and without you, we are not able to achieve our ultimate goal, which is eternal glory, holiness, sanctification through you. So God, as we move into this week, we ask, first of all, that you are with those prayer requests that were mentioned at the start of class, that you provide the, the health and, and protection and comfort that is needed to see those through those, see those people through those situations. We also ask for all grace and, and glory be given to any unmentioned requests for prayer as well. Uh, God, you know what's on our hearts and you know exactly what we need far better than we do. And as we move out into the world, God, let us be imitators of Christ. Let us be the disciples that you call us to be so that we may be the kingdom builders that you have put in us an ability to be. We ask this in your son's holy name. Amen.